Growing up in rural Ireland and spending my childhood surrounded by nothing but green fields, cities are always strange to me. It's an exciting kind of strangeness. I take pleasure in observing how urban spaces are laid out, how the look and feel of built up areas change as one moves from one part of town to another. Well, Mary Jean, thank you very much for joining me. Um, what do you think of my living room? It's a lovely living room, <laughs> very opulent. <laughs> thank you for having me here today. So we're going to talk about Nothing Ever Just Disappears, um, which you've had a chance to, to thumb through. Yeah, no, I'm very excited to talk to you about, I have the US edition here, uh, which is, I think, very beautiful. Um, I'm curious about, yeah, the origins of the project, you know, what drew you to these seven lives in particular, and also this idea of um, queer spaces that you mm. find so interesting. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, um, I suppose I think about my friend Kevin Killian, who I write a chapter about in the book, and um, he said that, he said something like, it's human nature for um, the old to rehearse the past mm. and for the young to crave it. Um, I suppose I'm not that young anymore, let's be honest, but um, I have always craved um, the queer spaces of the past. Mm. I mean, when we think about queer spaces, I suppose the first place we think about is a bar, right? Um, um, a gay bar on the corner or a queer club. And I think that maybe was what I was thinking of as well. And for me, I, I grew up in Ireland, in the middle of the countryside. Um, there wasn't a huge amount of, well, social life of any kind, let alone mm. queer social life. Um, and I suppose that feeling of, of, of isolation from a community made those queer spaces like bars and clubs with all of the promise that they held of community, uh, connection, um, a sense of um, a, a group of people with whom I could identify. Mm -hmm. I think that that was really, really important to me, and it stayed very, very important, and um, and 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 inspired, well, this book, but but lots of other um, projects and harebrained schemes that I've um, come up with. Um, yeah, I I think it was it, there was a particular moment. Um, in 2017, when University College London published a study um, into queer nightlife in London. And what they found over a 10 year period was that um, the number of queer spaces, queer night spaces, which, which would be bars and, and clubs, and that more traditional definition of what, what a queer space is, um, that the number of those places had dropped a huge number, 58%. And, and I was really, really shocked to read that study and, and there was a big article on it in the newspaper. And, mm. and it's, it was something that really crystallized a lot of my feelings that mm. he, here were these spaces which I attached so much feeling to, a lot of nostalgia, let's be honest. I mean, because, you know, queer spaces are not perfect and they never have been. Um, and so it was perhaps a romanticized vision of, of what they are and what they were. But nonetheless, to find that these hubs of community and, and solidarity were, were shutting down um, at a time when it felt to me that there was a world outside those places which was um, bent on rolling back mm -hmm. LGBT rights. Um, it felt really important to me to do a project, to do a research project, but something more really. I had no idea at that point what it would be, but at least it would be something that would archive, that would record um, the experience of um, those people that visited those spaces, what those spaces were like before they were shut down because of gentrification. 
um, all that. So it, it felt like this moment around 2017 that really felt to me um, like it, it, it launched a, um, a, a journey, a way of thinking that um, culminated in, in this book. I mean, you say in the introduction that an immigrant disposition is very key to the writing of this book. Right. So I suppose maybe we can begin with um, where we begin in the book, which is Cambridge. Mm. I'm interested in that journey from Ireland to Brighton, which is where I think you lived for quite some time, mm -hmm. and then to Cambridge, and how that journey has then led to the genesis of this particular project. Yeah, well, I mean, when I say that queer people are displaced, I'm talking about myself. Mm. I mean, I, I did have to leave Ireland in order to to find my people, to find my community, to find my home. Um, and I do think that that perspective is really, really important. Mm. Um, but as you say, I came to Brighton and I arrived there in 2005. And I stayed there for the bones of 12 years. And yeah, it, I mean, and that was kind of where I found that community, found those people. I mean, Brighton vies with Manchester mm. for, you know, gayest town in the UK. And there was something about the, the freedom of that place, just the relaxed attitude to um, sexual and gender expression, which was very, just really revealing to me. And, and um, I, I didn't really realize how lucky I was mm. when, I, when I just rolled up there, you know? And it taught me a lot about myself. Um, it taught me a lot also about maybe how insular uh, a queer community can be, um, because it was only when I came to Cambridge that I started to realize, yes, you know, how lucky I was. And I started to be grateful for, for all that Brighton had offered me, because there, there are lots, well, especially when I was there in 2005 and, and for many years afterwards, there were lots of queer bars, queer clubs, um, lots of cafes with rainbow flags in the windows. It, it really did feel like a place where community was really uh, visible and very active mm -hmm. and that uh, it had, you know, commanded space in the city. And then I came to Cambridge and I mean, in addition to uh, the very strange way that space is managed in, in Cambridge, there's a real lack of those kinds of queer spaces, you know, and uh, I, I was really intrigued as to like, well, why, where are they and why don't they exist anymore? I, I don't know how you feel, how do you feel about Cambridge? Yeah, I studied here for about six months in 2011. I was a study abroad student from the US, but mm. actually, you know, I'm originally from Hong Kong. So it was strange mm. that I was grouped in with the Americans. Um, mm. And I think my experience of Cambridge then was very much an experience of trying to fit in, you know, right. classic case of trying to assimilate in some ways. But also um, at the time I hadn't come out yet. Mm. Um, so I was actually closeted at the time and it's, it's interesting being here now as a, a poetry fellow and, and you know this is many many years hence and so um, I'm now out and you know a queer poet myself and so I think I feel so much more at ease just walking around and it's amazing mm. how it is the same city but obviously having found a home in poetry for me, that, that was the first safe space I ever discovered. It was a psychic place. It was a, a place in, in books, I suppose. We'll talk about Ian e. Forster later on and how mm. he created his Greenwood. And you know, at the time, poetry was my version of Greenwood, I suppose. But definitely I felt a lot more constrained um, in 2011 than I do now. Mm. Um, but also I wonder whether you know, people like you have already transformed Cambridge and that I've arrived after you know, things like, you know, the audio trail you've created and um, the club Urania that you've, you've founded. So maybe you could tell us a bit more about that, how you queered Cambridge or tried to, you know, add, add to the, the queer spaces that existed. Well, um, thank you. I mean, that's very flattering of you to say. And, but I would say that any intervention that I've made has been with friends mm. and it's been, you know, as, as part of a community, really, rather than a kind of an individual effort. Um, so I arrived and I looked around and I thought, 
where are the queer bars and where are the queer places? Where are these places that have disappeared and, and how might I uh, memorialize them? Mm. So I got a couple of contacts in the LGBT mature group. Um, so older uh, queer Cambridge people who have lived here for 10 plus years. Um, and I interviewed a half dozen of them and I just sat in their living rooms. Living rooms much like this. Um, and I just heard their, their stories about, well, where did you go on a Saturday night as, as, a, as a gay person? Where was the bar that all of the new queer arrivals to Cambridge turned up at? You know? Where were the political demonstrations organised? Where did you, you know, paint the banners? They just told me these wonderful stories about um, all of the places of the past uh, that Cambridge had, mm. which included uh, Terry's Bar. So Terry was a, a barman um, and well known as mother. And so you would arrive in Cambridge and, you know, somebody would probably tell you to, you know, make your way to Terry's Bar and, and he would welcome you. and. On Mother's Day, the place was, you know, festooned with flowers, and and I just loved that idea that that people, that strangers, that recent arrivals like myself or like yourself, would have a, a, a place, you know. And there was something about those stories that I really wanted to get down, but also I wanted to make it accessible to a broad public, and I uh, so I roped in a friend of mine who is a radio producer. And I interviewed these people who had become friends by that point. Mm -hmm. And I edited their stories together and plotted it along a route through Cambridge. And we made what became known as the, a great recorded history, which was a, an audio trail of Cambridge's queer places past and present. I mean, I would say present, but it's more and more past. And, and I love the what happened in the course of recording and editing those stories together and then plotting them along a route was that you got this kind of immersive sense of what the past might have been like, mm. I think. And you got the sense of the layers and, 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 and the loss, um, if we're going to be alliterative, the layers and the loss of of, of queer places in Cambridge. So, you know, you're looking at a department store or you're looking at a, you know, fashion clothing shop and someone's telling you about a completely different place that had, had uh, such a centrality for the community. Mm. And um, so, yeah, so that was the audio trail. And, and then um, it, it, it felt like that was only the beginning in some ways. And there was a way that I could create that sense, that evocative, immersive sense of a, a space um, in, in writing. I mean, you begin actually with a sense of loss in your first chapter about E.M. Forster. I was wondering if we could hear some reading from that chapter and then we'll delve more into it. Sure, yeah. I arrived in Cambridge in the winter of 2017. Apart from brief, ill-advised sojourns in such far-flung places as Mauritius and Norwich, I'd been in Brighton for more than a decade. In that time, the city had changed utterly, drastically expensive, unbelievably gentrified, and, with one or two exceptions, devoid of the kind of underground culture I loved. A couple of my closest friends, two queer women, had recently moved, finally pushed out by skyrocketing rent prices. They ended up in Sheffield, where they made their own queer utopia, girl style. It was time for me to leave the seaside for the Fens. Cambridge was so different from Brighton that it might as well have been the moon. The first thing I noticed was the careful planning of the place. The improvised feel of a city like Brighton was very hard to come by. 
everything felt static and administered. And you got the sense that even the most inconsequential outhouse had been built only after endless deliberation at meetings attended by old white men in mahogany panelled rooms. Public space in the city also felt very hemmed in, restrained by the private institutions of the colleges. Everywhere you looked, there was a big stone wall or a building topped with ornate battlements bearing the crest of such and such a college built in 17 whenever that reminded you that you were here only under sufferance. Sometimes this was quite literally the case. Lots of parks and greens you're allowed to walk through as a member of the public are in fact owned by colleges which graciously submit to their use by the hoi polloi. And those were the spaces you could access. Behind the college's enormous wooden gates, firmly closed to outsiders, stretched acres of beautifully maintained gardens, shaded woodland paths, secret streams and swimming pools, all open only to members. College and city, private and public, inside and outside, I came to know Cambridge as a space of carefully managed dichotomies. This seemed to be Forster's experience too. Reading Forster after I arrived in Cambridge, and in light of my growing familiarity with the city, I began to understand how the place affected the author, how his experience of the space resonated in his writing, his sexuality, his constant negotiation between feelings of constraint and freedom, reticence and candour, his double life. Thank you, that was beautiful. It certainly piques the reader's interest. Um, I was just wondering why you chose E.M. Forster as the kind of key figure for your Cambridge chapter, if you could tell us more about this character. Um, I think E.M. Forster, novelist, essayist in his later years, I suppose, is one of the best known queer writers of Cambridge. Mm. He came here in 1897 um, as an undergraduate to King's College. And he's so deeply associated with Cambridge. I, I can't think of another writer who's so evocative of Cambridge as a place. Mm. And I was really interested in how he thought about spaces, you know, when you think about a book like Howard's End, which is all about, which is all about place and it's all about people's emotional connection to this house that, mm -hmm. that has been inherited or not inherited as the case may be. And he's always creating these places and, all, and, and also these kind of fantasy spaces in his, more in his short stories. That are, that are liberated, that have a certain amount of freedom, that are, um, whose relationship to reality is, um, a f there's a fine line between the, between the two of them. So why would somebody who was so interested in these fantastical spaces, these free, liberated, fantastical spaces, um, be so interested in, in, in staying in a place like Cambridge? And that was the original question, and ultimately it, it became clear to me that he was the kind of person who, in his emotional life, was very compartmentalised. Mm -hmm. And that felt to me like it mapped very easily onto the space of Cambridge, which, as we know, is a very compartmentalised kind of a city. What I found when I was researching Forster was that, so he came here to study classics. Mm -hmm. So what Forster was seeing when he was going to tutorials in classics mm -hmm. was that he was, he was exposed to um, a queer society, but one which was completely out of sync with Victor the Victorian society that he was dealing with. So that felt to me like a really interesting contradictory experience also, mm -hmm. right? The feeling that you know he was he was living in this kind of Edwardian England, which was approving of Greece in some ways, but in, but not in others, 
And then he was reading, you know, Plato's Symposium, which is um, in some ways uh, uh, an endorsement of homosexual love. Mm. And of course, you do mention that, um, you know, ironically, obviously, King's was a, a college of men because you know, women weren't admitted until, I think, 1971. So actually, it was a very homosocial environment uh, that he lived in. Mm, yeah, and, and very encouraging of um, bonds between men, you know, a communion of souls, you know, that was the original model that was uh, developed in Oxford and then imported into Cambridge. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about um, his classic novel Maurice and how in your research for this project maybe it helped you read the book differently? Yeah, uh, well, so Morris is this gay classic. Um, it was published in 1971. But it seems to me, in the light of what I discovered in walking around Cambridge, in feeling into the place, and in researching Forster's life and his life here, is that that experience really fed into Morris and these the the novel's um, homosexual love story between you know, Morris and Clive and their love begins in Cambridge, but it can't endure because they leave Cambridge. You know, I'm interested because obviously you say that Cambridge ultimately was perhaps a place of contradictions and constraint for E.M. Mm. E. Forster and maybe a place of disappointment on some level. And yet that mm. somehow was where you began then the rest of your journey to pilgrimage to places you know, that were inhabited by the queer characters you mm. decided to write about. So maybe tell us a bit more how you then moved to London and then Paris and, and beyond. So, yeah, the, the journey from Cambridge continues to London. And I explored the lives of, you know, little known uh, queer suffragettes before the First World War. Mm. Because there were, there were a group of really interesting um, women dramatists, actors, directors for the theatre that were part of the arts and culture of the suffrage movement. And it felt to me like they had a really interesting perspective on public and private spaces mm -hmm. in, in, in London, given that their time was so defined by an, the idea of separate spheres, that men and women should have separate spheres, that the public realm should be for men and politics, the political sphere should be for men and the private and domestic should be for women. And, and these suffragettes, queer suffragettes in particular, were transgressing that, that border. From there, we go to Paris in the 1920s um, and the bisexual entertainer, Josephine Baker, who is kind of synonymous for, not just for me, but for a lot of people with the jazz age of Paris. And then um, I took a trip to Jersey, to the island of Jersey, where I looked at the archives of a surrealist artist called Claude Cahun, uh, gender bending, mischievous um, resistance fighter, mm. um, who used their art in order to kind of push back against the Nazi occupation of Jersey. And then I went to the south of France and there was more disappointment in, in, in the offing in the south of France where I was looking for James Baldwin, the writer and, and civil rights activist. I was looking for his house. I didn't have a huge amount of hope, <laughs> um, but when I arrived, it certainly it wasn't there and had been bulldozed. And, and this is related to the Forster chapter as well. And, and that sense of disappointment as, 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 as a as a spur to thinking um, and that in fact that it can be more productive than you know seeing a brick and mortar monument to mm. uh, to a queer forebear. Um, I spent a lot of time in New York when I was researching my first books and it was really great to go back there and to look at the life and work of Jack Smith who's a filmmaker, performance artist and who used you know the detritus of New York the, the trash that he found in the streets um, to ornament his exotic fantasies um, uh, of um, 
a place he called, well, I suppose he called it Atlantis. But um, so he was, a, he was a filmmaker who didn't have any money and he made his homes into his film sets. So, um, and then finally I went to San Francisco and which is so um, evocative, I think, for many people of the LGBT rights movement. And um, my friend Kevin Killian, who was a writer there, he, um, he was so characteristic for me of what that meant, what it meant to be a queer writer in a place like San Francisco. But I think, okay, in general, this isn't uh, a, a, an attempt to create a new canon. It's, it's a personal, what they call a personal archive. It's people who have been very influential on me in the way that I see the world and experience it. But it's also um, figures who have been very, very important to thinking about the importance of, of place and creativity and sexuality. Hmm. I think it's, you know, one thing you do, I think brilliantly in this book is that you do insert yourself into the narrative. So there is no sense of this being sort of a, an objective overview of mm. these historical places, which can sometimes almost leave the reader feeling a little cold. But in fact, mm. you, you know, you pilgrimage to these places, you document your, your joys and your, mm. you know, disappointments and in particular that trip to the the Baldwin um, house in, in the south of France. I think you basically missed a bus and you had to walk and <laughs> there was this despair on the roadside when you realized the bus had just passed you. Yeah. Um, I think that was a, a really beautiful moment because it, it sort of shows you as in fact one of the characters in the book. Mm. Um, mm. And I wonder whether you had any maybe stories to share about any surprises that you encountered whilst you know going on one of these pilgrimages. Any particular moments that you you didn't realize would um, take place? Um, well, I suppose the and this maybe pertains to the um, the idea of of the archive and the surprises of what the archive will turn up. Because so when we think about archives, we think about oh, it's a record of of truth, right? You know, that's where the the real is, mm. and. I, I, that may be the case in a place like King's College archives, where um, E.M. Forster's entire life is there mm. to be viewed, um, and and it's very revealing. Um, there's a line in, in in his locked diary that I remember, and it's um, the life of the flesh is best. And who would have thought somebody like E.M. Forster would come out with a statement like that? But that, that is very revealing of the kind of person that, that he became once he had his sexual awakening. And so, yeah, archives can be re very revealing. They can also be really surprising. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to Jersey and I spent some time in the archive of Claude Cahoon. So, so Cahoon was, a, um, as I said, a surrealist a photographer, performer, who was uh, born in France in 1894 and then moved to Paris and became part of the scene um, there in, in the 1920s. And with her partner, Marcel Moore, moved to uh, Jersey in 1937. And uh, they lived there quite happily for, for some time until the, the Germans invaded. And then from that point on, they mounted this surrealist resistance by um, leaving seditious tracts in the church, in the pews of the church, or in the, the jackets of uh, a, a Nazi officer. Um, and, and it was a really surrealist and a creative kind of a resistance. And they were arrested and they were sentenced to death. And at the last minute, the, they, um, the, the Nazis were defeated and they were released from prison. But after Cahoon died, because nobody really knew about them or, or their partner, Marcel Moore, in, in terms of their contributions to art, their work was just um, sold off. Mm. It was put into tea chests uh, with a lot of books and then it was, it was sold at auction for half nothing. And so people um, bought these tea chests, found these photographs, and sometime in the 1990s, um, people started to become interested in, in Claude Cahoon again. And, uh, and then that's where all of the archive material comes from. 
But what the surprise was for me was that I was going into this archive attempting to get this revealing portrait of a subversive photographer and I was just being impeded at every turn because I would, I would take out some archive material and it would all be kind of like jumbled up so mm. the, there would be, there's, there wasn't any sense of like progress from ah here is Claude Cahoon as a child and here is Claude Cahoon as resistance fighter. It was like they were all together and they were all shuffled together. And there was something about that experience, given that surrealism is so interested in the, 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 the practice of chance operations, that that felt surprising, but totally in sync with what I knew about Cahoon. Um, and I talk about that experience in, in, the, in, in the book. I don't know. Have you? I don't know. Have you spent much time in archives? Or no, I, I personally haven't. And I am interested mm. in this idea of being surprised by an archive because I mm. think my sort of stereotype of an archive is more like what you described in, in sort of the E.M. Forster archive mm. of something mm. being very well organized, almost sanitized. Yeah. yeah. Um, a bit stuffy. Mm. And sometimes also personally, I find archives can be a bit alienating because it feels like you almost have to be a trained researcher or have the key to mm. unlock an archive. And, mm -hmm. and I also remembered, whilst I was reading your book, um, a piece by the, the poet and um, writer Jay Bernard, mm. who wrote an essay called Stranger in the Archives. And mm. I wonder whether you have mm. any ambivalent feelings about archives um, when you were doing your work for this project. I suppose I, uh, I don't want to give you the impression that I spent a lot of time in archives. I did, and, and, and the scholarship is, is there. And sure. um, But what I because I also spent a lot of time in archives for, for my first book, mm -hmm. for this one I wanted to, to break out of that sense that research is only conducted in archives, mm. in libraries, mm. you know, sitting on one's own um, late into the night. Yeah. Um, it's also about getting out into the world. Yes. And, and this is why this idea of a pilgrimage is, is part of the, the, the narrative of the book as well. Yeah. That sense of, and I suppose pilgrimages have this history of being um, devotional, this religious aspect, but in maybe like a contemporary culture which is saturated with celebrity and fandom, they are a lot about fans as well, right? Mm. So fans make these pilgrimages and I'm, I, have, I have no shame in admitting that I am, I am a fan of, of all of these. Um, uh, Figures. And so I think that I really liked the balance that I was able to create between um, objective, traditionally robust scholarship and um, subjective, improvised, um, surprising journeys mm -hmm. and conversations with people. You yes. know? Do you feel like um, some of the conversations you had on site or mm. you mentioned friends as well? I think friendship mm. is quite an interesting uh, model that you use for the book. I find that there are a lot of horizontal relationships and especially um, this brings me to the, the Baldwin chapter, which I think particularly fascinates me because I, I've always mm. loved Giovanni's room and I've loved Baldwin's essays. It's very interesting that you note that out of all the the characters you've picked, he, he was the sort of the person who was like a stranger everywhere he went. Mm. and. I was interested in that sense of rootlessness and, and whether you felt that like that was actually very important to include in a, in a book about place, actually, mm. where I, I may be expected to encounter characters that were all very rooted or mm. um, sort of were based somewhere. But I think you do note that he is an anomaly in that case. Can you tell us a bit more about why you felt it important to include Baldwin's experience of placelessness, perhaps? Placelessness and displacement. Um, yeah, and displacement. Um, I mean, I. I, I, I have to say that it feels like he's a figure who's very important to me as a, as a person in terms of my, my personal history, that I, um, I, I, I still know what it is to be displaced and to have to leave, you, to leave my home. And I, and I think that it's very important to keep, um, to, to think about that idea of displacement because it is so, it's so characteristic of the world we live in now. And, um, and I think what, what the problem with Baldwin is that he had this idea of home. And in, in Giovanni's room, one of his characters says, like home as a... As a, as a as Irrevocable a condition. Irrevocable condition. 
and I think he had that sense of, of home as, as something, a chronic problem, mm. um, that he was always trying to find it. And then as soon as he, he made a home, he would, um, you know, um, just blow it up and, and move away, you know. I mean, even his house in the south of France, he had the opportunity to buy it, but he, he didn't, you know, he just rented. Mm. And that's why it, doesn't, it no longer exists. But one of the things I, think I talk about in the book is that maybe that's okay. Like maybe it's okay that there isn't a Baldwin house mm. because maybe the best way to commemorate a life that was so peripatetic is, is, is not in a brick and mortar home. So I was particularly drawn to chapter seven um, where I think your writing style changes slightly here. It's a more personal tone and um, obviously Kevin Killian is also a friend. So um, I was wondering if you could read from that chapter. Sure, I'd be happy to. And the chapter is called Niche, Kevin Killian, San Francisco. Through the window of the BART train heading west into San Francisco, I watched the wide, empty spaces of Oakland inch by, slow as oil tankers. Outside, an enormous concrete monotony fills the view as far as the eye can see, all eerily unpopulated, save a couple of articulated lorries churning laboriously across it, turning in wide parabolas, otherwise emptiness, and the occasional cross-hatching of roads like something painted by Agnes Martin if she'd been very, very bored. Then, all in a rush, come the shanty towns of the homeless, by the side of the road, in the shelter of the freeways, underneath the overpasses. Pitched in temporary structures, sagging green tents, huts assembled from pallets, blue tarpaulin yoked to fences, rusty Toyotas, lean-tos encircled with trash, on this train of the future past, an automated marvel of the 1970s, but by now a beleaguered relic, we zoom forward but can't shake them off. Out of the window, still more of America's homeless. The entire scene is bathed in an unreal golden light that turns everything hazy and pink. A ready-made Instagram filter for a photograph nobody will like. The homeless of the Bay Area are remarkable, for their sheer number. Shuffling by in half shoes with dirty brown sleeping bags thrown over their shoulders, pissing in the gap between train carriages, panhandling, punctuating street corners. More than any other place I've visited, homelessness in San Francisco is ever present and insistent. It mutters in your ear or to some ghost you can't see. It blasts a tinny pop tune on a bashed up radio. It trails the deep rectal stink of the ever unwashed. Yet the city's residents appear oblivious to it. Somehow they can breeze through the hordes huddled around subway stations and ignore them completely as they pass on into Whole Foods or Starbucks or the Apple Store. Some kind of adaptive tick allows them to leap over the chasm of inequality to observe the multitudes of destitute and immiserated without registering them. How else do you move through the spaces of San Francisco, they might say. My brooding on homelessness also has something to do with the reason I'm here. To visit my friend Kevin Killian's final resting place in a cemetery outside San Francisco. I've asked myself the same question for the past few days. What kind of world gives the dead more property rights than the living? As if in response to the sepulchral turn in my thought, the train plunges suddenly downward, howling and shrieking, racing beneath the waters of the bay. Thank you. Um, that was really uh, lovely. I guess I'm interested in this idea of homelessness and um, this idea of you know, queer people needing safe spaces. And of course, mm. this term has almost become ubiquitous and mm -hmm. sometimes almost devoid of meaning in that people think it's a buzzword, but actually that idea of a safe space and, and a home mm. is, is an irrevo irrevocable condition, as Baldwin says. Yeah, of course. And um, I mean, we know that um, the family, the traditional heterosexual family unit has not, uh, has generally not been accepting of, of queer, 
um, queer people, queer desires, love, and and that is one of the reasons why like chosen family and uh, elective chosen family of, of friends I mean, we talked a little bit about friendship and I think that that's a really important um, that's really important to me and I, and I think that that's those those non-biological kinship bonds are the lifeblood of the queer community mm. but I think also you know to turn our backs on the, the heterosexual family, where queer people grow up, where they come from, um, and to think that it's a lost cause, that's a kind of a relinquishing responsibility in a way. So, you know, part of what I'm trying to think through is like, well, you know, maybe if we made the traditional heterosexual family home a more accepting, um, a, a, a more a more loving of all um, different kinds of sexual and gender expression. Maybe if that were the case, mm -hmm. then we could treat this at the source in some ways. And um, that's not that's not going to be possible everywhere and, and for everyone. But yeah, a little bit more compassion and, and a little bit more acceptance, I think, in the family home. Yeah. Definitely. I think that's a very beautiful wish and, and that's something that I think we all are striving to maybe create. In a way, reading this book, it makes you feel like you can make your own personal pilgrimage, that you can have mm. your own personal relationship with these queer icons, as you say. Mm -hmm. That in fact, it's not something that is reserved for the, you know, the academic or the researcher, that we can all take steps towards mm. um, you know, exploring these places that mean so much to all of us as queer people. So thank you so much, um, Dermot. That was such a fascinating conversation about this book. I wish we could keep talking. Um, but this brings me to my final question and thought. Um, I suppose circling back, you begin the book by noticing the loss of queer spaces, especially mm. you mentioned the UCL study of um, queer spaces and, and nightclubs and uh, bars. I wonder what you think is the state of queer spaces today um, in the UK and if you could give us your thoughts on that. Well, well I think since the pandemic, anecdotally at least, the, the closures have continued and we can expect at the same rate as before the pandemic, if not worse. Um, the, the Glory in London, uh, which is a, a really important queer hub performance space bar, um, recently had its you know, closing night, um, uh, and it's been forced out due to gentrification and redevelopment, which is the same old story, really. Um, but, you know, there are reasons to be hopeful, you know. So when, when I saw that there were no queer spaces in Cambridge, um, with a group of my friends, we got together and we created a club night called Club Urania. Um, and its name is steeped in queer culture. Um, we hold it every month and um, it brings people together. Strangers that are just arrived in Cambridge turn up on our door and we introduce them to, um, to friends and people that we know. And, and then the next month they're up on stage. And, and I think that that's really important. And I think that that maybe is what I've concluded in, in writing this book and in making Club Urania. And I feel like Club Urania the making of that space is one of the most important influences on the book, actually. Mm. And it feels to me that, you know, queer spaces are not just found, you know, that we, we make them. And, you know, that we will make them over and over until everyone has a place. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. Thank you, Mary Jean. Thank you. <laughs>